Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. Good evening. My name is Sharif Girgis, and I'd like to welcome you to the third annual Veritas Forum at Oxford University. Here and at dozens of universities in North America and Europe, the Veritas Forum offers a chance to escape our sometimes narrow and fractured specializations and consider together some of the more perennial questions that give shape to all our lives. The free pursuit of these questions is also part of any university's mission, a mission to which we hope to contribute by putting the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth in conversation with other worldviews. While drawing on the insights of scholars and thoughtful observers, our exchanges aren't purely academic. They're meant to issue not in proceedings and articles, but in greater reflectiveness and mutual understanding, the seeds of personal growth and friendship. Tonight's forum, sponsored by the Graduate Christian Union and supported by groups like the Oxford Pastorate, the Catholic Chaplaincy, and the Oxford uh, Secular and Atheist Societies, focuses on how secularists and people of faith should order our common public life. Our title quotation comes from a telling episode in the ongoing struggle to answer just that question. Seven years ago this month, Prime Minister Tony Blair was asked about his faith in a Vanity Fair interview. His communications director, Alistair Campbell, quickly interjected, we don't do God. It was a blunter form of the answer that the Marquis de Laplace had given Napoleon when the emperor asked Laplace why he hadn't mentioned God in his book on the universe. Monsieur, he said, I had no need of that hypothesis. Why should it be any different for us when it comes to the conduct of our public life? How might we have need of religious or perhaps secularist hypotheses in that realm? The answer begins by recognizing that a vibrant society depends on more than having the structure of a liberal democracy, important though that is. We also need the moral resources to accomplish what the procedural mechanisms of separation of powers or majority rule or judicial review can't alone provide. First, we have to find common purpose across creedal and ethnic divides as we use those institutions to pursue a genuinely common good. Second, we need to develop a robust account of human rights and liberties and forms of aid to the needy to be asserted and reasserted against selfish interests, the powerful majority, the overweening state, and aggressors from within or abroad. And third, we need a set of shared cultural narratives and moral commitments by which to pass on the same civic principles to the next generation. Does Christianity or some faith-based worldview provide a more compelling account of these ideals? Or would a secularist culture, one free of religiously informed principles and arguments, be more adequate to the task? Would the latter provide a more neutral common ground? Or is there no such thing? These will be our questions tonight. But our discussion will proceed a bit differently than usual for this familiar topic. Some would defend their side by imputing to their opponents various crimes committed in the name of religion or irreligion, as the case may be. So forced conversions, crusades, and suicide bombings, or suppressions of speech, gulags, and gas chambers. Though not irrelevant, that sort of historical tallying can tend to overlook confounding factors. It also counts a strike against any one form of faith or of secularism, as a strike against all such forms. And finally, it assumes that anything done in the name of some worldview is done out of genuine fidelity to that worldview and doesn't represent a mere distortion or abuse of it. To minimize these problems, as noted in your programs tonight, we've asked each of our speakers to focus in his opening talk on his own worldview and on the positive within it. To what extent does it really provide reasons for our public values and ideals? And are these reasons sufficiently non-sectarian to promote tolerance and cooperation amid pluralism? 
Then, in the moderated discussion, we can explore apparent problems with each perspective, as well as the comparative question of whether either is a better public philosophy overall. Now, let me just introduce our first speaker. Christopher Hitchens is an English-American journalist and author whose career spans over 40 years, though you can't tell by looking at him. He's been a literary critic, columnist, or contributor to Vanity Fair, Slate, The Atlantic, The Nation, The New York Review of Books, and many other publications. He read philosophy, politics, and economics at Balliol College, Oxford, and has been a visiting professor at the University of California, Berkeley, the University of Pittsburgh, and the New School of Social Research. A trenchant political and social commentator and self-avowed anti-theist, Mr. Hitchens has written several books, including The Missionary Position, Mother Teresa in Theory and Practice, and God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Hitchens. Well, my thanks to the noble Sharif for that suspiciously terse introduction <laughs> and for his um, kind remarks about my agelessness. I have to confess that there is a portrait in my attic that's beginning to look distinctly seedy. <laughs> Haven't been here since I came to hear Claude Levi Strauss give a, his wonderful lecture on the scope of anthropology. Uh, but Oxford is my town, it's my family's home and my uh, my university, uh, Balliol just down the road. And before you get to Balliol, you get to the Turl, where my mother once swore that she heard the following from a bewildered American tourist who said, I, I can never tell which is Lincoln and which is Jesus. <laughs> to which someone returned, uh, that's the problem with all you Americans. <laughs> now, we're, we're not supposed to do God this evening. Strangely enough, it's one of the very few occasions I've been asked to debate religion not doing God, but I can't avoid a, a slight reflection by way of introduction because I want to talk about the American experience in the secular uh, square and sphere. Um, when Abraham Lincoln was dying in a room just off Pennsylvania Avenue with a terrible wound in the back of his skull inflicted by a racist Lunatic. He was living in the age of newspapers and print. There was a newspaper published just around the corner, the Washington Star. In the age of photography, we have Matthew, Matthew Brady's photographs of him and of the Civil War. Not in the age of, of tape recording exactly, but in the age of very, very good stenography. And we still don't know when his cabinet gathered around him and saw him die I think Seward was there, the man who later bought Alaska. I'm sure Herndon was there. I haven't looked this up. You can. It doesn't matter particularly which of them said this. But one of them said either, as he died, as he drew his last breath, either now he's with the angels or now he's with the ages. We still don't know. And there's no reason why we shouldn't. Eyewitnesses, literate men, practically contemporaries of ours. In the age of print, in the age of photography, and nobody knows which thing Seward or Herndon said. And yet we're expected to take at face value the statements of illiterate, stupefied, terrified peasants from the most benighted part of the Middle East who founded monotheism. And I say this not to break the rule about not doing God, but because until that kind of conflict's been resolved, and on the principle of a necessary uncertainty, about the recording of these myths and the hostage it's made us, all of us, since, to village squabbles and clan wars in the desert. All of us, all the time, are being forced to consider the outcomes of these irrelevant combats. Until that's the case, it seems to me the burden of proof is and always will be and has to be with those who say, no, only if you believe all of it can you hope for salvation, redemption an afterlife, an eternity. Those of us who say that the rule of doubt and of uncertainty, which also governs all other observable principles in the universe, 
I think you're entitled to say that until something like evidence is produced, we're entitled to be free of it. Uh, you can't make us believe it. If you want to believe it, that's fine. We hope it cheers you up. We hope it comforts you in your last hour. But we don't want to hear about it. We don't want to have to be told about it. We don't want the Queen to be the head of the church as well as the state and the armed forces. We don't want the ridiculous situation that will occur as our sovereign lady draws, may it be a long time distant, her final breath and her bat-eared, Muslim fancying, no choice and no taste in women son becomes at that moment the head of the church and the armed forces in the state. That's what you get if you found a national church on the family values of Henry VIII, by the way. We don't, we don't want it. There are a lot of us who think it's absurd, that it makes the country look silly. We think it's preposterous that there's a bench of bishops in the House of Lords. And all the rest, uh, the church schools can claim subsidies. And all the rest of it. Now, the great breakaway, the great English revolutionary breakaway from this was the American Revolution, which was founded on two principles. One was adumbrated uh, just after the revolution, and one was enshrined in the Constitution consequently. I'll just take a moment to describe it. Um, the Church of England was expelled from the United States, at least as a established church. It, it no longer had a monopoly. Up until then, um, therefore, uh, if you'd been... And after the revolution, if you were a Catholic in Georgia, you couldn't run for office. If you were not a Catholic in Maryland, um, you, rather if you, were, if, if you were a Catholic in Maryland, you were the only person who could run for office. Jews were forbidden to run in uh, New York. Um, everyone was different. The state religion of Georgia was pronounced to be Protestant with no further definition. Um, in Virginia, after the scrapping of the established church, it was decided to have a debate. <laughs> Patrick Henry, great revolutionary, said we should now subsidize all churches from the taxpayers' money, not just the Anglican one, the Episcopalian one. Uh, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison made the first ever statement of this kind in human history. They said, as a matter of fact, no church sh should be subsidized. All churches should be allowed, from Muslim, there were no Muslims in Virginia then, to the synagogue, to the Catholic, um, to the Presbyterian, and so forth. But no church should receive the favor of the government. That Virginia Statute on Religious Freedom, which, which guaranteed, by being secular, here's my point, obviously, by being secular, guarantees religious pluralism. There is no guarantee of religious freedom without a secular system became enshrined as what we now know as the First Amendment to the Constitution. And as a result, the persecution of Catholics in Georgia ceased, the persecution of Protestants in Maryland ceased. And you may remember, some of you will already know, that Jefferson as president was sent a letter from the Baptists of Danbury, Connecticut. It's a very famous letter. They wrote to him saying they didn't feel safe in their own state. They felt unwanted, persecuted, put upon. They invited the protection of Washington the capital, I mean, and, and of the president, Jefferson. And in the famous letter that he wrote back to them, he said, you may rest assured that there will always be a wall of separation, you've heard the phrase, um, that no, sh no one on, on account of their belief or religion shall ever feel uh, persecuted in this, in this republic. Now, just for fun, is there anyone who knows what the Baptists of Danbury, Connecticut were frightened of? Very good. Actually, very bad, because it's only one. But well done. They were afraid of two. They were afraid of the Congregationalists of Danbury, Connecticut. That's who was persecuting them. Now, I actually do understand the difference between a Congregationalist and a Baptist. It's not a very interesting one. It's worth, it's, it repays a certain degree of study. But we don't have to know anymore, because that persecution was put an end to. No one shall have any preference on account of their faith. You are free to practice any religion, and you are free from religion as well. And under this great roof tree of the Constitution, as Jefferson described it, has grown up the most pluralist, the most democratic, the most multi-religious, the most uh, tolerant society in the world where it is illegal for the government to support the establishment 
even indirectly, of a church. Now, I believe this constitutional principle should, should be further tested. I believe, for example, I'm actually bringing a motion about it uh, to their attention, that the Supreme Court in Washington should hear evidence that no United States money can be used for the building of settlements on the west bank of the River Jordan. That this, uh, an illegal establishment of the Jewish religion by, for, with American money, unconstitutional, we can't do it. I think that the same should be said to the Saudi Arabians, that until they allow synagogues in Saudi Arabia, until they allow Christian churches in Saudi Arabia, and most important, until they allow the Tom Paine, Richard Dawkins study library in Riyadh, <laughs> they're not allowed to open any more madrasas in the United States with covert Saudi money. You'll see why I suddenly shift to the foreign arena. I only have three more minutes. Um, look to your east, see how the Russian Orthodox Church has become the black cowled guardian and clerical guarantee of the, the newly revanchist, expansionist, great Russian chauvinist, KGB-like regime of Vladimir Putin. If you haven't looked at it yet, look at it now. You're gonna be hearing about it very soon. It's gonna be adding to your woes. Look and see what's going to happen when a nightmare that was being discussed when I was a young man at this university, what will happen when a crazed regime gets a thermonuclear weapon? We're about to find out in Persia where an ancient civilization has been blotted out and, and superimposed upon by a theocratic regime that considers all adults as children and as property of the church. You're about to see what happens when the messianic settlers get busy. You're about to see uh, what happens when, uh, as, they, as they never cease to try to do, uh, the Christian right in the United States argues for the teaching of nonsense in school to American children. E or sometimes, when they're feeling cowardly, equal time for creationism. So, yes, children, after the chemistry period, uh, we'll have our alchemy class. <laughs> after we've done astronomy, there'll be, Mrs. Watkins will take the uh, astrology group after break. <laughs> we'll wear out the day in this way. No, we won't. That's flat out unconstitutional. We beat them in court every time, every day. They're never going to get away with it. Um, is there anyone here who, when they look around, just some of the places I've mentioned, uh, wishes that uh, the Israelis were more orthodox, that the Russians were more devoutly committed to their church, which says that not only should Russia be Christian, but it should be Russian Orthodox Christian, and bans Baptists and Catholics and any other kind of religion. Don't they see the, the pearl that they're throwing away that until they understand that secularism is the only guarantee of religious freedom, religious pluralism, there will be no progress. L check it on a graph. Look at the Muslim world. Look at any, actually any country in Western Europe. The further they move away from an established church, the more democratic, the more prosperous, the more pluralist, the more open, the more available to innovation they are. Do it on a graph for the Muslim world. Indonesia, Turkey, Tunisia, reasonably tolerant places to live precisely because there's no Sharia, precisely because there's a, a separation made between church and state. This example works, if you think about it, I'll, invite, I'll leave you with a thought because my time's up. This works in all countries, in all societies, and at all times. So, um, not to argue um, from authority or from a majority, but I really do hope it works with you too. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks to Mr. Hitchens, and our next speaker is John Haldane, a philosophy professor and director of the Center for Ethics, Philosophy, and Public Affairs at the University of St. Andrew. His research interests include issues in the history of philosophy, philosophy of mind, political and moral philosophy, and aesthetics. Professor Haldane obtained a Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy in 1980 and a PhD in 1984. He's held fellowships from the universities of Oxford, Cambridge, Aberdeen, Edinburgh, and Pittsburgh. A proponent of analytical approaches to the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas, Professor Haldane has authored or edited dozens of articles and books, 
including An Intelligent Person's Guide to Religion, Faithful Reason, Reasonable Faith, and Atheism and Theism. He's also appeared on several BBC radio and television programs, as he will tomorrow on In Our Time, is that right? On BBC Four, I think. And has contributed to The Times, The Daily Telegraph, The Scotsman, and several other outlets. Please join me in welcoming Professor Haldane. Uh, thank you very much, Sharif. Congratulations on organizing this, and uh, thanks also to the many others who I know have been involved in this organization, particularly the, those uh, who are members of Veritas, but also the other associations uh, that you mentioned. Um, there's going to be a certain a contrast, but also complementarity, I hope, in these contributions. Um, I, in one respect, I suppose part of what I want to do is draw out a certain structure or map uh, and part of what Christopher Hitchens has been doing is applying high color to certain elements within that uh, structure or map. But uh, the, the issues that I'd like to sort of put before us are ones that I think are of broad and general interest and increasing urgency. And they do bear upon questions of uh, the possibility of articulating and sustaining um, a tolerant humanism. And I think that's something that actually turns out that we share uh, a desire to see diversity recognized and celebrated, and, but as, well, as they say now, drilling down into that, asking the question, what are the conditions, this is a philosopher's question, what are the conditions of the possibility of that recognition and that respect? And I want to be suggesting that the conditions of that possibility take us in the direction of philosophy, but more beyond that, take us in the direction of a certain kind of worldview, a religious worldview. So, um, the question I take it that's before us, or at any rate, one of the questions that's before us, is how to secure a common public uh, life structured by shareable ideals, and shareable is going to be uh, important in this context. Um, it's pretty obvious, I mean, if anybody who reads the newspapers, listens to radio or television, or just sort of engages in a sort of ongoing ethical debate, it's pretty obvious that we see ourselves confronted by uh, a, a remarkable range of ethical disagreements about substantive ethical questions, whether it be questions of abortion, gay marriage, uh, family life, uh, warfare, and so on. It goes on endlessly. Now, one thing, if one looks at those questions and the terms in which they're debated, is that there is an interesting agreement in form with respect to the ways in which they're discussed. That is to say, there's a recurrent tendency to structure those questions in terms of things like uh, welfare, on the one hand, and notions of respect on the other. So people will argue that, uh, let us say, that certain economic policies are justified by the promotion of welfare, or that certain constraints are required uh, on account of respect. That's true, so there's a commonality of form, but what there is immediately beyond that is disagreement about substance. That's to say that those notions of welfare and uh, of rights or of respect are themselves disputed uh, with regard to what their content is, what their range is, and what their implications are. Now, I think the fact that there's this uh, agreement in form and disagreement in substance is itself uh, rather significant, because what I think it points to is a common philosophical and religious heritage that's showing through in the expression of those concepts, but uh, the decline of that philosophical and religious heritage is part of what explains the disagreement when it comes to matters of substance. So beyond that, what we find is, uh, I think if one were to draw a kind of chart, for one axis there was time, um, and another uh, a sense of the range of, of, di of issues that challenge us, and another element, perhaps, uh, the question of the resources that we have available to us, what you would find is that the, there's an increase, there's a line that rises, which is the line of identified ethical challenges, ethical, social, political challenges, and that is crossed by another line, which is the ethical, social resources commonly shared for the resolution of those questions. When those lines crossed, I'm not exactly sure, sometime, I think, in the 20th century. That's to say we had a sense that the ethical resources, the common ethical resources, were declining while the ethical problems were uh, increasing. And now those two lines stand at some distance apart. And one question, then, is how those might be brought together again. 
Now, in the task of trying to structure uh, a common public life, a set of values adequate to arbitrate between uh, competing uh, views with regard to some of these issues and more broadly with regard to the structure of society and the way in which we might organize our lives, with regard to those, there are kinds of two sorts of values that are at issue. I think actually Christopher touched on one of these. There are certain procedural values to do with notions like fairness, um, equality of access to positions and so on. And then there are substantive uh, values. Now with regard to the procedural values, these are typically justified uh, by reference either to notions of respect or to notions of utility or welfare. And I want to come back and ask briefly where those notions of respect and utility come from. With regard to the substantive, you can only get so far with procedural values. You can sort out matters of fairness, equality of access to positions of power and so on, but that still leaves you with certain unanswered questions, which is what conception of the good, what set of values ought we to be in pursuit of? Uh, obviously, there's much more to be said about that, but at this point, all I want to say is that engagement with those fundamental questions about issues of substantive values is unavoidable. Uh, one simply cannot resolve all the questions simply by reference to procedural values of fairness. One has to actually ask at the end of the day, what, what goods are we trying to pursue? But the further problem is, it seems to be both unavoidable but also unattainable. We seem to need a conception of the good, both individually and collectively, but we see more conceptions of the good, but that seems to be unattainable. Why unattainable? Well, one set of considerations which I'm, which I'm not going to touch on, uh, not that they've not been pervasive and influential, but I think of them as being very broadly, if I can put it this way, vulgar, are considerations of relativism and skepticism. I don't think, as it happens, that uh, Christopher Hitchens or I are inclined to ethical relativism, and nor, I think, are we inclined to a deep ethical skepticism, but I'll let him speak for himself. But I suspect that we are committed to the idea that there is right and wrong, there is good and bad, but we might dispute what its origins and what its content is. So I'm not going to say anything about that. The unattainability that confronts us is not the unattainability posed by the relativist or the skeptic, it's the unattainability that's posed by ethical disagreement. We need uh, agreement on uh, substantive values if we're going to structure our lives individually and socially, but it seems that that kind of agreement is not available to us because of deep, deep uh, disagreement. Now that issue, how to structure so a society, how to structure a life in the face of deep disagreement is one of the principal themes of contemporary American political thought. Uh, it articulates the structure of contemporary liberal theory in the United States, particularly but not exclusively in the work of Rawls uh, and others. Rawls uh, contrasts uh, different approaches to this, but basically he thinks that we live in a, in, in a, under conditions in which it simply isn't possible to base our lives on a shared, what he calls a comprehensive doctrine, as it were, a broad philosophy of life. Now, I think he's right in part, he was right in part about that, but I think he was wrong in thinking that it was possible to do it on some other basis as well. So, uh, let me just say something about some of the concepts and some of the ideas and some of the values that feature rightly in our ethical discourse. One is the notion of human dignity. Whatever it is we want to say about how we should live our lives, and particularly how we should articulate our policies, we're going to have to have some regard for the notion of human dignity. Secondly, it seems to me, importantly, is the notion of the inviolability of the innocent. Uh, this is invoked on one side by um, those advocates of pro-life causes against abortion, against certain forms of euthanasia and so on, but it's also uh, invoked by advocates of just war theories and in other contexts where they see innocents being slaughtered or put at risk in some way. So human dignity, the inviolability of the innocent, and then thirdly, I would say, a duty of concern or regard for those in material or psychological, or one might even say spiritual need. Now, what I'm interested in is this. What is the source and foundation of those notions, notions of human dignity and viability of the innocent and duty of concern and regard? Well, here are two secular efforts to try to ground those. One is in the impartial promotion of happiness, broadly speaking, a utilitarian approach that says that we can, un we can find a place for these values uh, in terms of this uh, regard for human welfare or human benefit or human happiness impartially considered. Each is to count as for one, nobody, for more than one. 
The second and alternative foundation is not in the idea of utility or the promotion of welfare or benefit or happiness, but in respect uh, for rights. Uh, and with regard to that, the idea is that each of us has an inalienable status that others must respect. Now, uh, I want to point out that it is very, very difficult, in fact, I think it's impossible, to give an account of why one should uh, constrain the distribution of happiness or benefit by impartiality. Why, is, why should we operate on the basis that each is to count for one? And why should we have a respect for rights rooted in the idea of the ethical status of individuals? Very hard to find a secular foundation for that, but relatively easy to find a religious one. The impartial promotion of happiness is rooted religiously in the idea that each one of us here and each human being throughout the world is an equal creation of God, that none of us exists save for God's chosen to contribute to, creatively contribute to our origination. And therefore, that being the case, none of us should be disposed to act to deface a work of creation, in particular a work of creation that is itself an image of God. That there's a kind of the desecration that we feel that comes in attacking the innocent and so on is quite literally that. It is an attack upon the sacred because what shines forth in the face of each human being is an image of the face of God. Now there's a foundation for the idea of impartial promotion of happiness that I think has no uh, equivalent or no so, substantive rival on a secular foundation. And likewise, the idea of respect for rights is rooted plausibly, it seems to me, and compellingly in the idea that each person is, like their creator, a center of origination of value and of meaning. Now, I think what's happened is this. We've continued to use these concepts that have that religious foundation, but they've become detached from that religious source, as it were, the source of energy and animation that lay behind them, gave shape to them, and kept them alive, has progressively been severed to the point where now they simply hang there and have just become part of a kind of sentimental rhetoric. Moral discourse is increasingly in our culture deeply, deeply sentimental. And the one thing that a religious foundation steers away from, at any rate, the religious foundation that somebody such as I am interested in, I was saying over dinner earlier on that uh, I'm slightly unusual in the philosophical community in also being a papist. But anyway, rate, what we papist philosophers are inclined to say is that well, sentimentalism has no place. So, time is up. We're going to discuss these matters further, I hope. But anyway, rate, there's an opening shot. Thank you very much. So I'd like to start the Q&A segment by asking each of you, actually, to, ask, to pose a question to the other that highlights what you consider a central difficulty for the other person's worldview as a public philosophy, as a foundation for these values and ideals that we're saying we agree on and need a foundation. Um, so Professor Haldane, why don't we, you go first and then Mr. Hitchens. Well, um, so, I, I, where I think we're in agreement is that we're seeking for a kind of tolerant humanism that can respect certain kinds of diversity, not any kind of diversity, but serious, seriously grounded diversity and difference. And I see the foundation of that as provided by respect for individuals as autonomous centers of created life, if you like. Um, and I suppose my question most basically Excuse just... Excuse me, did you say autonomous centers of created life? Created life, yeah. Uh, uh, which is also itself part of an ongoing creation, mm -hmm. I think. But I suppose my question, very simply, to Christopher would be this. What, what does he think grounds the values of human dignity, respect, human value, and so on, if not the kind of theological foundation that I suggested? Well, first, I think um, a fairly unsentimental realism, uh, which would consist at the minimum of a recognition that we're not created, that we are evolved, and that we are, in fact, identifiable members of a primate species with kinship with other animals. Some people don't like to believe this uh, or think it would be unpleasant if it was true, but it just is. So we may as well deal with that. 
I am generally tolerant. I love to teach arguments. I like to take part in arguments. But in this case, there is no argument about creationism versus evolution. It's over. It's been over since a debate at the Natural History Museum in this university in the mid-19th century. Um, the basis further for our morality, why is it that we think of others? Um, why, the, why do we care for them? Um, I think is equally simple, if you like, just as religion is preached to the simple and doesn't require a great superstructure of theology, the principles are essentially, I would even say simplistic, but we have such a thing as human solidarity. If we didn't have it, we wouldn't have got this far. The usual statement of the moral, the nearest statement we can make of the moral absolute, the, the best approximation we've come up with is what's called the golden rule. It's variously stated, but it's usually rendered as something like don't do to others what, it's, what you would not wish them to do to you. This, of course, makes it difficult to pass judgment on people like Charles Manson or Adolf Hitler. It, it's open to the charge that it's only as good as the person making it. Um, that's why I have a difficulty with the idea of moral absolutes, but it's, pretty, it's a pretty good approximation. There's no society ever been discovered that doesn't have some such principle. If you tell me that my grandmother's Jewish ancestors got as far as Sinai not knowing that murder and theft and perjury were bad and only then found out, I will say to you, they wouldn't have got that far if they'd been under another impression. There has been no revelation of this. It doesn't come from on high. It's innate. It's one of the things that makes up for being a primate. Um, if, there are some people who don't have it, but we call them psychopathic. Uh, and we have to reason it. Um, if Jesus and Muhammad and Abraham and Moses had never been born, which in any case I tend to doubt, or if all the stories told about them were untrue, if that was suddenly to be found and everyone had to admit it, some people I know would go into a panic. Now what will we do? We have no morals suddenly. What could be more nonsensical than that? As a matter of fact, the position we occupy would be precisely the same as it is now. If none of these texts had ever been written, if none of these supposed utterances had ever been made, we would still have to reason together about how to treat one another, about how to build a just city, and about how to have irony and a sense of humor. Um, so, that's my answer. And I think the idea that there's a supernatural dictatorship required for us to think about our duties and responsibilities to each other is the most sinister idea ever invented. These questions cannot be referred up to a celestial dear leader. We do not live and, and do not wish to live, fortunately in any case don't have to live, in a divine uh, North Korea. Thank you. Mr. Hitchens, your turn. Ah, I'll, um, already. Um, that, that's, um, I, I quite deliberately didn't ask myself earlier what I was going to ask, and I'm not even completely sure now out of a rich, a target-rich environment of stuff that I took from your remarks, uh, Professor Holden. I think, I think what I'd like to ask you is this, and don't think of it as ad hominem, please. Do you really, would you really prefer me to be a Wahhabi Muslim or an Orthodox Jew or a Jesuit? Do you think I'd be, I'd be a better person? Um, do you wish there were more Orthodox Jews, Wahhabi Muslims, uh, and Jesuits, um, and fewer people like me? And if, and if there were, do you think the world would be a more moral place? Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know whether the particular classes were chosen <laughs> with some... I could add, I could add to some, the potential some classes. sinister intent. Um, I could add to the feli, yeah, if you wish. Uh, I've no reason to think that simply by matter of some creedal affiliation that would be, people would be any uh, better or worse. And, and I think in that respect, it is important, perhaps I should make this clear in case the point had been missed. It's no part of anything that I've said so far that the content of morality derives from some set of divine commands. I mean, you spoke about the it's idea... It's not. No. You spoke about the idea of some sort of supernatural dictatorship or something of that sort. What I was talking about was it were the grounds of value, not the idea that these... If you take, for example, you, you mentioned the golden rule, right? Treat others as you would have them treat you. 
which is one of the formulations effectively of Kant's categorical imperative, another one of which is treat others uh, not merely uh, uh, as means but always as ends. Now both of those formulations, the interesting thing is, is if you ask the question who are others in this respect, right, this, this principle has to be applied when you say treat others. It doesn't include pieces of furniture, right? So the question is who gets in to the constituency of that? And my uh, suggestion is this, that when one starts to probe the question of who the other is in this respect, what comes forward is an idea of a person, the person, as a kind of um, site and locus of a certain kind of inviolable value. And my question, not to you, but I mean the question I, I'm mm -hmm. inviting others to discuss is this, what could explain the existence of centers of inviolable value. Now, here's one answer to that. The transference by a creator of a certain kind of value that is attached to uh, that deity itself onto others whom he chooses to extend as part of a certain kind of community of his own. And by the way, the community of his own here is not in the sense of a covenanted community or some set of people is against another set of people. This is all people. So nothing of what I had to say was to do with the idea that morality comes in the form of divine commands, but that rather the condition or the possibility of morality is that there be special kinds of beings in the world that nature itself doesn't account for. Good. All right, well, I have my own questions. First, for Mr. Hitchens. Um, how can your perspective, part of what we're talking about tonight is providing common ground for our public deliberations. And how can your perspective as Yeah, let's not overdo that. Right. <laughs> That's right. Well, let's be tasteful. Yeah. Um, how can your perspective provide that kind of common ground if it dismisses a large majority of the population as irrational, as stuck in what you call in your book the infancy of our race. I mean, doesn't that remove any room or incentive for people to try to reason together? Not at all. I mean, religion is a, is a private matter, in my opinion. Um, I, I phrase it like this in my book. I just say, if, if you think that there's a creator who's made you specially and who watches over you and supervises you, who cares about you and wants you to do well and even wants you to survive death. I think, I have to say, I think it's a preposterous proposition because I have to be honest, and an irrational one, and a fatuous one, and a sinister one, because the, the idea of wanting a father who never dies and won't quit is infantilizing. But suppose you did think that, shouldn't it make you happy? It doesn't make them happy doesn't make them better at all. They won't be happy till I believe it too. So the first principle is, and it's separate that. Keep it to yourselves. Go to any church you like. Build any church you want. Do it with your own money. Don't ask the government to teach this stuff to my children in, in, a, in a government school. We won't have that. And surely, who's the, in other words, I'm not, I don't when I'm offended by a filthy uh, article I read about atheists and Jews and secularists. I have to, bombardments of stuff of, of this kind comes at me all the time. I don't go out and burn down the nearest mosque because I've been offended, do I? Don't be ridiculous. But I'm supposed to respect those who do do such things. I'm supposed to treat them with an extra delicacy. Why should I be doing that? Who's the offended one here, really? I'm not going to make a big point about my feelings being hurt. I have a thick skin, I have a broad back, I've studied Socrates, I think the Socratic method's more convincing. But you act as if I'm the one who's offending them by saying, I find your beliefs actually rather unconvincing. And in any case, I'm not going to have them forced on me. Now, is that finally clear? Is it? I hope so. Good. Well, Professor Haldane, someone might have a similar worry in terms of fairness about your own view. So you think that a lot of the moral norms and principles that we, that we base even some of our policies on, so inviolability of the innocent and so on, are dependent on theological claims. But um, if, if we base political decisions on Christian ideas at all, um, isn't it unfair to impose those decisions on non-Christians who can't accept their rationale? I mean, especially if there are uh, non-theological arguments to make the same points. 
Well, look, I mean, what I'm suggesting is this is a kind of two-stage process here. First of all, what I think is extremely important, and this I, I agree ought to be a matter of common agreement, at least if not universal agreement, wide agreement between us, is that it is very important to fashion some basis, to identify some basis of common shared values beyond the merely procedural value that I made reference to. Because matters of mere procedural fairness are not going to uh, get us through to the deeper questions. So then the question is, on what basis does one do that? Now, I think that, uh, and here actually, again, I think there should be an area of agreement. I think that, for example, the thinkers of the Enlightenment who emphasized the importance of autonomy, of self-direction, uh, of lives lived from the inside, if I can put it that way, rather than, imposed, than order imposed from the outside, I think identified something very important. But I think we need to probe that question further. What is it to live such a life? It's not just to choose randomly, it's to choose in accord with the conception of value and so on. So what I see at the heart of human, I see two things at the heart of human nature. One is a striving, a reaching out for truth, a reaching out for goodness and so on, which we recognize in one another, as, and this enables us to identify one another as members of the same moral species, if I could put it that way. But I think we also find in ourselves and we find in one another a kind of conflictedness that expresses itself universally, quite independently of uh, culturally variant circumstances and so on. So what we're looking for now at this deeper level is an explanation of how it could be that we're beings of a sort that find ourselves directed towards the good and the true, but also beings of a sort that find ourselves apparently uh, irresolvably conflicted both in, t in our interior and in between ourselves. Now, I think at that point, the, uh, the story has to continue. You can't just stop at that point. And I think a religious foundation here of the sort that I just sort of suggested doesn't turn at this point on the tenets of particular revelations. If you like, in that respect, as a natural theological foundation. But the question then would be, to what extent is that picked up in particular faiths and traditions? And I think, by the way, that in this respect, there is a moral criterion of the adequacy of particular revelations and faiths the extent to which they do or fail to conform with those ideals and values. So uh, I don't think that every faith is to be respected. That's why you know, I'm not interested in a kind of sentimental universalism that accommodates faith as if it were some sort of trump card in every context. context. There are some faiths that are absolutely you know, abhorrent. Uh, there are some uh, scriptures that are abhorrent, and one has to apply a test of reasonableness. But I think at the end of the day, the foundation of that reasonability rests beyond a confined natural human nature and points in the direction of a kind of supernatural order. That's the view. Got it. You, you say got it? <laughs> Just registering. No, but you said, you said got it, and you let him get from natural to supernatural without a word of transition. So press the point. No, yeah. well, what, what grounds do you have for thinking there's a supernatural dimension? Well, because, sorry, the form of the argument was something like this. How are we to make sense of this, right, this sense, the sense of our status as moral beings that have these two aspects, as it were, that reaching out to value, but on the other hand, seem in ways conflicted. Now, if you like, this, is a, this is a, uh, seeks for a kind of anthropology, an account of what it is to be human. And I think we stand in need of a philosophical account, if you like, or an ethical account of what it is to be human, such that we can fill in things like the golden rule, so we know who falls within the scope of that. Now, I think that when we look around for such, the richest understanding of that comes from religious directions. That's the claim. It's not meant to be a deduction strictly of that. It's meant to be a question, if you like, of what provides the best account or explanation. And in the meantime, it also stands as a challenge to secular accounts that simply would treat these things as freestanding, <clears throat> as if they simply arise without explanation. But you're making a mystery where none exists. I mean, if you make the assumption, <laughs> if you make the assumption that we are members of, a, of an evolved higher primate species, and you, then you look at us and think, why do they have wars? Why do they have sexual jealousy? Why do they have rape? You understand already. There's no mystery about it. Yeah. But also, why do they have families? Why do they have emotions? Why do they care for their children? Same question can be asked, is asked about chimpanzees and dolphins. There's no, there isn't a mystery. You're creating one where none exists. You're piling on supererogatory but no, you see, assumptions. I, I, but I, I was very glad to okay. see you make the concession earlier that there isn't any necessary connection between faith and morality. 
I think that's a rather larger concession than I expected so soon from you, sir. Well, that's why I made it fast. But look, the, the, the question is not whether or not we can't find sort of social pressures and features that have adaptive utility and so on that might contour certain patterns of human behavior. The question that's more interesting is our capacity to engage in the reflective questioning of those habits, those inclinations, and so on. So we might say that, look, we found that certain sort of thing has benefited us over the years, over the century, over the millennia. The question is, ought we to behave in that way? And the idea that certain things have just benefited it doesn't, in and of itself, answer the question as to whether or not this is a good and noble and decent way to live. And it's that question, which I think is a pressing question which we feel, beyond, as it were, what nature has forced upon us. So it's the question, how ought we to live? And that's a question that only moral beings can ask. And by moral beings, I mean beings that are not simply determined by those evolutionary and historical pressures. I didn't say, I wouldn't say determined, but let's, shall we say, at least say conditioned. And, by the way, not created. But you, ask, you talk as if we have a responsibility to a higher being, which we don't. Um, when you say, since mammals do behave in this way, would you agree, that's the is bit, then we, of course we can ask, ought they to? But isn't, isn't it, once you've made my assumption, a slightly odd question? But look, it's our capacity. Will they, what about a question like this? Do you think they will go on, we, our species, will go on making war, torturing each other, killing each other, raping each other, dis, dissing each other, and so on? You can, I think you can probably, as a believer in original mm, sin, I presume, yes. and make the assumption that they will. But I, without original sin, can yeah. tell you that that will happen. Yeah. And the question, I suppose, would be why. But look, the, the, the point is it's just no, there's that no ability. Why. There's, no, but no, it, there's it, no why, there's okay. no mystery. But it is precisely that ability to reflect upon our condition that reveals us to be moral beings that transcend that mere evolutionary history. But look, you know, that's going to be the point of contention. Also, we're usurping your shirts. Yeah. Uh, that's true. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. The next question was for you, Mr. Hitchens. Oh. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Goody. <laughs> it's a clarification from some of your writings. Um, so you've written that civil rights reformers like Martin Luther King were, despite appearances, not really religious, but secular. And that certain murderous tyrants like Stalin were, again, despite appearances, not secular, but religious. Um, so what do you mean by that? And why isn't it just a case of calling anything you dislike religious and anything mm -hmm. you like secular? Right. Oh. I didn't mean it to be an applause line, but yeah, that was I'll e take it. That yeah. was a rather easy clap, I must say. Well, but, um, <laughs> well uh, anyone who's read Dr. Martin Luther King's speeches or indeed his doctoral thesis will know that he was a rather complicated um, Hegelian, that he, of course, didn't believe in the Exodus story, though that was, the, that was the text he took, because the only place you could make a public speech if you were a black man in the South at that time was from the pulpit, and it was the only book everyone knew. But a moment's thought will tell you that the Exodus story would have entitled his oppressed tribe to kill and dispossess anyone else who got in their way. That's why we don't have any Amalekite problem anymore, or Moabite, or Jebusite problem anymore. And in fact, Dr. King, fortunately for us, obviously didn't believe the Exodus story. He believed to the contrary, and a good thing too. So that's the first thing. And the American Anti-Slavery Society when it was first begun, was decorated by wonderful non-believers like Thomas Paine and Benjamin Franklin, and it took the Christians, and even then, several more decades to catch up to undo some of the harm that the Christian authority and warrant for slavery had done. And even then it went on in the South uh, under the same warrant of the biblical separation of the races that the, the motto of the Confederacy, Deo Vindice, by the way, is the motto of the Confederacy, God on our side, the same slogan that appears in German on the belt buckle of every Nazi soldier, and the same words that appear in the oath everyone had to take to Hitler, I swear in the name of God uh, for the Fuhrer. All of that uh, can't be described, I think, as secular. Um, with the Joseph Stalin uh, question, I'll have to take just 30 seconds. It, it's a little more complicated. If you become um, the head of uh, a Russian state that for several thousand years of serfdom uh, and slavery and Jew baiting and war and feudalism has taught millions and millions of peasants that the head of the state is somewhere a little above the throne, a little below heaven, something supernatural. If you, uh, if you don't take advantage of that, you really shouldn't be in the dictatorship business. He had a ready-made ready audience of credulous believers. And what did he produce for them? 
an inquisition, a really ingenious inquisition, a tremendous, one of the greatest heresy hunts in history, miraculous harvests, all flowing from the dear leader, the biology of Lysenko. Uh, you can fill in the rest for yourself. And always at his side, invariably at his side, the Russian Orthodox Church, which to this day produces icons, painted ones, beautiful ones in some ways, ugly in others, showing his face with a halo around it. He never, he never ever repudiated the allegiance of or was repudiated by the Orthodox Church of his country. If you want to call this secular, you're entitled. But don't try it again when I'm here. <laughs> then one more question, and then we'll go to audience questions. Professor Haldane, there may be side worries about taking a kind of theistic public philosophy as the foundation, at least for our norms in civil society. I mean, for example, isn't it easier to fall into fanaticism if you think you're discharging some divine command as opposed to just following common sense secular ideas about the good of helping people and the bad of harming them? Well, there's certainly uh, recurrently a kind of fanaticism associated with absolutism. Um, but I think two things about that. First of all, that, that is not the privilege or prerogative exclusively of the religious. Uh, and secondly, I think it's, come, it's a consequence of a kind of fallacious inference. Um, as I see it, I put it like this. The, the, here's one way of raising the question. Who is the better friend of tolerance, uh, the believer in absolute truth or the believer in relativism? Now, I'm inclined to say that the better friend of uh, tolerance and toleration is a believer in absolute truth. And for the following reason, but we can see how this might also go wrong, the believer in absolute truth thinks there is something to be discovered. And if that person has any experience of serious inquiry, they will know that human beings are fallible in the effort to discover it. But they will recognize in others what they find in themselves, a desire to discover it. And so the ground, what, what that belief in absolute truth does in the human search for it is grounds a respect for fellow inquirers and a recognition of the fallibility that we exhibit in our efforts to discover it. So there's a kind of toleration that comes from recognizing others as seekers after truth and the difficulty of discerning that truth. But what some absolutists about truth have done is transfer the attitude that is appropriate to the object of their inquiry, namely truth, and intolerance of error in that sense of falsity and such like, to fellow seekers and have become intolerant to fellow seekers. But not only is there nothing in the doctrine of absolute truth that requires that, there's something in it that seems to me to exclude it. On the other hand, the relativist is gently disposed towards difference and wants to perhaps respect and regard or, have, or be tolerant towards difference, but they may make the mistake of then transferring the attitude that's appropriate to the person, namely that of toleration, to the idea of truth itself. And so in losing the idea of a notion of absolute truth, they also lose the possibility of grounding a sense of value in that inquiry. So the claim I'd want to make is this, that uh, intolerance is not a consequence of a belief in truth, a truth to be discovered. Intolerance is as equally, uh, I mean, it can, it can arise from people who have that view, but that's a mistake. And it's equally and increasingly more commonly to be discovered on the part of people who have no regard for truth. Where is it coming from? Go ahead. Were you going to add something? Well, I, I'm not sure it's my turn, but... Um... Well, it, in principle it isn't, but I, right, yes. I give you a turn. Okay. I just spent. <laughs> you appear to say that though, because if you had said that someone is more inclined to be tolerant if they possessed absolute truth, you would obviously have uttered a nonsense. No, I wasn't saying that. Um, but uh, people who, of course, people who think they have the absolute truth, yeah. believe me, you don't need, need me to tell you, are capable of anything, including tremendous lying. Yeah, but there's no point in yeah. repeating the so thing instead I didn't of, say, So right? instead of saying that, you seem to say that there exists somewhere mm. a platonic absolute truth, right. but it can't be attained by us, though we keep looking. How's that different from relativism? Well, because, uh, first of all, I didn't say platonic, but what no, I mean, I'm just saying, the, you, the you idea... Don't say, you don't yeah. say... Uh, well then, you, yeah. you, uh, just to be short, you don't say anyone has absolute truth or access to it, do you? No, what I'm saying is this. The, the, the question was whether or not people who take a view about truth, let us say, or absolutism and so on, are intolerant in certain ways. My, my claim was this. 
that in fact a belief in objective truth combined with uh, two... No, sorry. Well, you can absolute. have... A, you can, all right, we'll have absolute in there. All right. A belief I'm, in I, absolute... You can't, you can't well, I mean, climb down that fast. That's fine. No, by absolute, I mean non-relative truth. There really is some fact of the matter. That fact is not conditioned by or dependent upon human opinion. With regard to some matter, there is a truth that is autonomous and independent of us and is as it is, uh, thus and so, right? So absolute in that respect. Now, my point was this, that a person who believes in that combined with... Two further thoughts common in the traditions. One is that we are interested in that and that human inquiry is directed towards the discovery of that. Science is one example, ethics is another. There are lots of them, right? Areas in which we seek out truth of that kind. A person who believes in truth, believes in the value of seeking truth and recognizes human fallibility in that effort has a foundation for a kind of toleration in recognizing in fellow human beings, fellow seekers, respecting also the fact that they too are subject to the burdens that we are subject to in our efforts to try to understand and discover these matters and that produces a kind of fellowship of common shared human understanding. Take away the notion of absolute truth and all you have as it were is, is, a, is what a fashion of the moment as to where it is that things tend to go at any given moment. All right well look I'd now be usurping the as we would the right of the audience to ask a question, but I'll just have to leave you with this. I mean, are you saying we'll know absolute truth when we find it? Uh, and I could make a statement of objective truth easily enough, and so can you, but can you make a statement of absolute truth while, you, while we wait to well, find what it is? Well, how I, is that different from a relativistic, skeptical, open conversation? Well, there's a, well there's, look, open conversation, skepticism, and relativism are three different things. Right, but they, with regard to the question... They're a trinity uh, that partakes of one another, then. Well, uh, I hope not. If the condition of the possibilities of an open conversation is you'd be a relativist or a skeptic, then I would, that seems to me a mistake. But look, the point was simply uh, this, that if you say, well, so give us an example of something that might be an absolute truth, then I do think, and I, maybe we share this actually, but on different foundation, that something like human life, innocent human life, is something to be respected and not violated. Right? That's a, that that's seems a, to me to be the product. That, that's a precept, not a truth. Well, I'm not sure what you're taking that difference to be. Well, innocent humans die in their millions every year for no reason than that they're born to a primate species on a very harsh planet. Well, that's we a description. We can't of say what, we dislike that. No, that's a description um, of what, what, what might happen. Well, to we people. can say Mine we dislike was a claim it, about precept. what we ought or ought not to do. But look, I mean, I, that's I don't the, know whether. That, that is not a statement. Okay. What you just made is in no sense a truth statement. Well, I'm well, fine. Well, 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 others can judge that as well. Right? No sense a truth statement. Very well. It's your turn. Sorry, comrades. On to the audience. Uh, here's a truth. The, it's not a joke, although it might sound like it. The, the regulations of health and safety forbid the use of microphones on the upper level for fear of dropping the microphone on the head of someone oh, on the lower level. So, the hate to break it to you. So we will go with questions so around here. Rosalind or Brian will bring you the microphone. And right there's our first one. Please right. stand. Mr. Hitchens, I wouldn't call myself a fan of yours, but I am a devout YouTube follower, so it's a pleasure to actually hear you in person. Thank you. Um, I want to challenge an assertion in your book, and you argue that one of the reasons why religion poisons everything is because it's abusive to children. Now, multiple studies have shown that in the U.S., religiously active youth are less likely to be depressed and commit suicide, and they're less likely to abuse drugs and alcohol. So my question would be, how could child abuse have an empirically verifiable verifiable effect on youth that is so positive? Uh, was the question, I'll just say, audible to everybody? Right. So I, I fear that you would do this. You give me the task of making your question not just audible but intelligible. <laughs> the gentleman asks, or claims to know, that the more religious you are as a young person in the United States, the less likely you are to be depressed. Or alienated, um, and uh, connects this by what means I don't know to the question of child abuse, which is a euphemism for torture, rape, and psychic destruction of children. Um, well, uh, two things. First, it is said that Louis Farrakhan's Nation of Islam group gets black kids off drugs. I have no means of knowing whether this is or is not true. Uh, but let's grant that it might be true. It doesn't seem to have been established, but 
it doesn't alter the fact that the Nation of Islam is a racist uh, crackpot organization, which anyone would, interested in mental uh, health would be well advised to stay away from. It is said that the Mormon church uh, has a lower incidence of misery in family life and higher motivations. It might, that might, for all I know, be true. But it doesn't alter the fact that Joseph Smith's fake religion is an outrageous imposture on human reason and, and, and uh, uh, dignity. It's, it's, it's a cult. Um, it's a regrettable fact that some people do better in cults because they need, they're so weak-minded and cowardly that they need the support of a pseudo family. This says absolutely nothing at all about the value of religion, let alone its validity uh, morally or philosophically. I hope, I hope that's clear. Since you've brought up the question of the rape and torture and psychic destruction of the lives of children, I suppose I'll, I will just do this. I because, thought this might come off. Hmm? <laughs> I, it, it's awkward because I know my vis-a-vis know my -vis of Dr. Aldane is a, is a practicing Roman Catholic, but it does seem to me that after what we've learned about what the Roman Church has done to the children entrusted to its care, that there's, I don't know of a single case, and I've studied quite a lot of them, Australia, the United States, uh, Ireland, uh, France, Austria, Germany, Italy, and this is by no means an, an exhausted list, that there is no case where those children wouldn't have been better off if the secular courts had had the ordering of it, instead of private secret religious courts that were interested not in what you call, rightly, the inviolability of the innocent, a precept, not a truth, but a precept that you, that you invoked, uh, but were instead uh, uh, concerned only with the silencing of the victims, um, the exculpation of the, of the criminals, the covering up of the crime, and the continuing uh, exculpation, cover-up, and blackmail of the victims, now practiced by the very head of this church himself, a man who his followers believe to be the vicar of Christ on earth. I ask you, who can, who can think of this as other than a grotesque parody of even the most elementary principles of decency, ones which we don't have to be taught? Who doesn't know that the rape and torture and desecration of children is wicked, is an iniquity, and what is, and how, I'm never going to be told again by the Roman Catholic Church that I wouldn't know good from evil if it wasn't for them. I'm sorry. I'm never going to hear that again. Good. In the front row there. Yep. Okay, thanks for your talk. Um, I don't think we can, I don't think it's particularly productive to discuss what the substantive truth of, for instance, any one religion is, because obviously we can get into sort of hermeneutic debates and endlessly can you, sorry, debate it. Can you give it not, some well yeah. Stand oh, sorry, up sorry. and slow down. Yeah. So, okay, I'm not, uh, like, I'm not particularly interested in debating the, the substantive content of a religious faith, Islam, Christianity, or Judaism, but someone who actually um, grew up in Iran has experienced theocratic dictatorship and uh, the yoke of uh, sort of the particular curse of the religious state, I could say that um, I don't really need to get into sort of a long sort of long-winded debate to decide which sort of state I would prefer to live under. It's more of a statement, to be honest. Mm -hmm. We don't really, just looking at the results of that state and sort of the horror it's reaped on that country, I don't think we need to sort of, uh, you know, to look any further to the results of, you know, living under the sort of religious tyranny. Well, good for you. Well, let me well briefly said. turn well that said. into a question for Professor Haldane. <laughs> Professor Haldane, how is your view distinct from or at least, why doesn't your view lead down the road of a theocracy? Well, look, I'm mean, sorry. I mean, a theocracy is a, is a claim about the authority of uh, a church or some religious structure to govern uh, something like a state or uh, to have jurisdiction over a population uh, with the sphere of its liturgical and other practices, for example, that it would make law more generally. Um, I, I don't see any connection. For, well, I have two thoughts about this. I mean, one is I see no connection between the things I have said and the idea that theocracy might in some way be a good thing. Secondly, the history of these things 
teaches us, even those of us who inhabit these religious spaces, that theocracies have proven to be a bad thing. But thirdly, one of the ways in which they've proven to be bad is that they're injurious to the religions themselves, that they actually corrupt the religious values themselves by bestowing upon the occupants of religious offices ambitions that are quite beyond yes. that of proper spiritual care and what is their, the sphere of their competence. Absolutely. So I don't think that this is an issue as well, for the, or let's put it this way, a religious believer who's interested in a theocracy seems to me is somebody who's more likely to be interested in power than they are in religious values. Bravo. My point. Our point. Very good. <laughs> well, it's distasteful well, to you. Well Too much agreement. <laughs> We're not allowed to agree. Or no. <laughs> Go ahead. Bring it Hi. on. Um, I have a question about religious pluralism. So. Listen, I'm sorry, we are having difficulty up here, I think, hearing the questions. Could you just go, if, I don't know about others, but if you could just go s slightly slower, please, and yes, then we'll please. hear them, I think. Sorry, is that all right? Okay. So I have a question about religious pluralism. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Hitchens spoke about religious pluralism sort of as secularism, and I first wanted to contest that conflation and talk about religious pluralism as something that's not a reality of religious diversity and plurality, but sort of a state of what do we sort of a positive definition of what we do with the reality of that diversity. So I kind of, I wanted to ask what each of you, what your vision of religious pluralism is, acknowledging religious plurality in a world where religion is in or is out of the public sphere. I'm sorry, I missed it. In a world in which... Well, one of you is clearly arguing for religion to be part of the public sphere and one is arguing for religion to be right. out of the public sphere. So what does religious pluralism look like to you in each of these situations? And not just pl not pluralism conflated with plurality or secularism. Can I it's just start with a shot of that and then please. you can see how we're coming in? Yes. I mean, supposing some, maybe this will help, I don't know. Supposing somebody said, what is your view of, say, aesthetic pluralism? The idea that out there there are people who, uh, some of whom, take principal pleasure from, say, music, others from literature, others from the visual arts, plastic arts, and so on. And then within each of those, there are some who have these preferences and romantic, classical, and such like. I think the, response, the natural response to that would be that each of these answers to a certain appetite or a dimension or an aspect of the human condition and human sensibility and such like. Now, it seems to me to some extent, to some extent, this is true of religions as well. That is to say, there are those, there are aspects of human nature that tend in the direction of the ascetic, the spare, the restricted, the disciplined, and so on. And, you know, Quakers in one direction, certain kinds of free Presbyterians in another, and so on. And you could find outside Christian traditions these. And there are others that go for a certain richness, a liturgical complexity, ritual and such like, sacramentalism, a great theological complexity. Now, to some extent, it seems to me that is a reflection of different aspects of human sensibility. I don't think that in the sphere of religion, any more than the sphere of the aesthetic, one could, as it were, set out some unitary mode of religious expression that could satisfy all aspects of, as were, human sensibility and human condition. So it seems to me religious pluralism, in one sense of it, is precisely what one would expect to find, given the complexity of human psyche and sensibility and so on. Now, there's a different question, of course, about religious pluralism. One, as were, a theoretical one, is there some difficulty for religion reconciling these differences? And there's a political question or a practical question, how are they to rub up together? And you know, <laughs> Christopher Hitchens is quite rightly often pointed to their inability to rub up to, go, to, to uh, effectively coexist. I think the explanation for that, by the way, is a very deep, uh, common one, which is that human beings have difficulty inhabiting the same space. They compete for that space. And this is a general question, independently of whether you're religious or not, finding a foundation in which, a basis on which people can inhabit common space. Now, that's part of what we were discussing tonight, but these are very large and complex questions. I think I was the one who she misunderstood the most, even so. <laughs> um, and it's my fault, I dare say. Um, but let me clarify it. Um, there was established during the McCarthy period in the United States uh, by Billy Graham and various other right-wing evangelicals a panic resolution in Congress establishing a national day of prayer. National day of prayer. It was last week. 
Um, an organization with which I'm associated, the Freedom From Religion Foundation, secured a judgment from a judge in Madison, Wisconsin, which will now, I think, be heard by the Supreme Court saying that that national day of prayer is unconstitutional. Americans can pray any time they like, but the government can't tell them to do so. Pretty simple proposition, you'd think. It takes forever to hammer this principle into people's heads. One way to do it is to say, all right, from tomorrow, all school children in America will have to pray. Billy Graham might brighten up, say, but it'll be Hindu prayer. They said, we didn't mean that. We didn't say you didn't. Oh, or do you mean that what you said you wanted was a national day of Christian prayer? Or just Protestant Christian prayer, to be exact? Because otherwise we can say they all have to say Hail Mary in school, and surely that'll be just as good for their moral education. Or they'll all have to go to shul. Or they'll all have to make the, the Muslim profession of faith. Surely any of these are better than secularism or atheism. They don't get it. What they don't understand is it's only people like myself, the secular forces, who say the government has no business here, who guarantee that they won't be oppressed by another religion. And it's, in other words, there, there is only one way in which any society has ever guaranteed religious freedom, and it's by a wall of separation between church and state. I really don't think that penny should have taken so long to drop, if I may say so. Rosalind, can we get that gentleman right here? Yeah. Cool. Uh, thanks very much for a fascinating uh, debate. I have a question from Mr. Hitchens. Um, Mr. Hitchens, you seem to have been seeing yourself as debating with an audience um, the sort of, of whom is to whom the book, The God Delusion, is directed. Whereas Professor Haldane seems to have been speaking more within the context of the last 300 years of moral and political philosophy. Um, in particular, people like John Rawls um, and Bernard Williams and Simon Blackburn. And so I want to get back to the question, um, which I think was the first that Professor Haldane asked, and which is specifically mentioned um, in the synopsis of this talk, which is, do you think, and do you accept that the only way that you as a secularist can normatively can ground your normative conception of the person is simply to say, well, it's in my intuition as an evolved being, and if you don't share that intuition, then there's not much I can do to persuade you. Did you say intuition? Yeah. Well, you've already earned your applause. Um, I think it came too soon. Uh, be careful about that. Um, <laughs> I, I simply don't share the grammar of your question. The, the feeling that I have of being an evolved member of a primate species is, excuse me, not an intuition. Hold on. So I think it, that, that wasn't my, my question at all. Um, the, the question is, okay, well, well, then we, you are, might, we see we are you all... You might have left that bit out there. We are all evolved members of the primate species. I accept that entirely. Now, having accepted that, yes. and living in a society um, where we, lots of us don't share religious intuitions, and you as a secularist, when it comes to debating within society and using reasons in public debate, what reason do you have when you're arguing in favor of things like fundamental human rights? What reason do you have to ground those rights and normative conceptions of the person? Well, first, I'm not taking a secularist position. I'm, I'm an atheist and an anti-theist. The main common ground I have with Dr. Haldane is, is if I was a believer, I would still be for the separation of church and state for the excellently phrased reason that he gave. You remember how Dante says, I see the Pope is still fornicating with the emperor. Uh, that it isn't just that I don't want the, the society or the state re, religi, re, religi, <clears throat> religionized, but if I was a believer, I wouldn't want it corrupted by association with state power. In other words, the worst, the worst moment comes when the Emperor Constantine says, this is now the official religion of my empire. That's a terrible thing. And we have parodic subversions of that, like the absurd appearance of that sheep-faced loon Rowan Williams in the House of Lords. A place which he, I mean, he has no right to legislate just because he's a bishop. But that, that, I, would, that I would say if I was an Anglican. 
you, when you said, what's my grounding? How do I know there are such things as human rights? I don't. I don't know there are such things. I have a very strong suspicion that Bentham might have been right about that. That they're not, they're, they're certainly not from God, because if they were, a few more people would have them or have had them. The concept is only a few hundred years old. It had to be wrung out of the, the, the bogus concept that there was a right, but that it was a divine right and only for kings. It's an attempt to negate and spread that made by Thomas Paine. My strong suspicion is also you don't get the rights you don't fight for. Um, so that's my grounding. I think, I, think our, I think our position there is about as tenuous as our position as a primate species on a rather dodgy planet. All right, do we have Unsupervised. <laughs> the microphone up there. Yes, Mr. Hitchens. Sir. Uh, from Virginia, I'm uh, pleased to actually uh, express appreciation of separation of church and state, like you mentioned. Thank you. I also uh, can recognize the, the problems of having beliefs forced on you. I also can recognize the, the depraved human condition that we lived in. I also can look at the issue that you might say of no responsibility to a higher being. I would also um, agree to your accurate criticisms of man-made religion. There's a butt lurking here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Surely not. <laughs> I can also um, ag agree. Just try to speed to, up to the question I'm, I'm, in the I'm, and, and I'm the forgiving question. butts time. Right, yeah. yes. And, and one of the issues I noticed, though, is that um, you are able to, at, at times it appears, the intent <coughs> and the content of some of your criticisms are, are very heartfelt in disappointment with the concept of, of um, benevolence. Of, uh, of, of, of a sense of uh, life as a gift. Right. And the sense of present as being a present. And what I ask you is, um, some of that criticism seems to be beyond uh, the capacity of a primate. And so I ask you, as, as a not religious person, but as a Christian, um, oh, that... <laughs> it's come yes. to that. Yes. yes. Uh, one who disdains the ignorance of, of, of man-made religion uh, because of the thousands of years of, of, of outcomes of it, I ask you, where in the world is that source coming from that is actually able to articulate the concept of one who is disappointed and as a and standing in the position of an anti-theist, because I would say perhaps that source um, might be inspired. Yeah, <laughs> it, um, <laughs> it got less good as it went along. I, I think I, I pr started very promisingly. Um, <laughs> Well, but by the way, I, I, I knew this would happen, um, and you must see it a lot. You know, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not religious at all, I'm just a Christian. Um, is, it, is, it not George, is it not, it's like being an Anglican, is, is it not George Herbert, the great poet of Anglicanism who speaks of the sweet mediocrity of our, our native church? It commits you to nothing. I, um, I th actually, my impression of, of Christianity is that you are a Christian if you believe that God gave a son for the redemption of our sins and allowed him to become a human sacrifice as the seal of that pact. If you don't believe something like that, uh, that a human sacrifice commits you even if you didn't want it to happen, I don't really think you can say you're a Christian. Um, you ask me what I think the source is, um, and where you almost seem to ask, where does my divine spark come from? Well, sweetie. <laughs> um, I don't know, but I don't, I don't mind not knowing. I look forward to discovering further frontiers of my ignorance. Socrates was never wiser than when he said the, the, the definition of the educator is the one who has some idea of how little he knows. And the more education you, you get, and the older I warn you, you get, the more you'll find out that you know more and more about less and less and less, and more and more and more things. And it's wonderful. It's a tremendous experiment in learning. So I'm quite happy to say I don't know, but the believer has to say that they do know. They can't, they can't hedge this. If it be not true, as St. Paul says, that Christ crucified rose again, we are the unhappiest people living. 
That I can take seriously. That I can understand. Um, and I take leave to doubt it. And I don't believe there's any salvation. I don't believe there is any redemption. Um, so that's my answer. Okay, next question. Try to make them quickly, please. I'll, I'll try and be we're, more We're officially time. over time, so I dispense I'll you I'll from be here. More briefly. Quickly. If God is omnipotent, how free is free will? That's for you. <laughs> and then we'll go to this channel. <laughs> this is the sort of thing that we would normally do over a 12 week course. <laughs> um, so let me just answer it in the following respect, um, which is really a synopsis of what that course might involve. Interestingly, uh, Thomas Aquinas. Uh, a figure revered within my intellectual tradition, indeed within my church, uh, was in fact a theological determinist. He thought he could reconcile uh, determinism with human liberty, and in that respect he was like David Hume, who also thought you could reconcile determinism with human liberty. I don't think you can reconcile determinism with human liberty. In this respect, I'm opposed both to David Hume and to uh, Thomas Aquinas. But I don't think it's to do with uh, divine omnipotence. I mean, I don't see that as being the key to the problem. Now, I understand why you might think it is, because you're assuming that God has foreknowledge of all that's going to happen. If he knows what's going to happen, it must be that in some sense it's fixed antecedently that it's going to happen. Um, all I would say is <laughs> this is probably week three of this, uh, where we talk about what's known as middle knowledge and God's uh, knowledge of ungrounded counterfactual propositions, but I'm not going to get into that right now. Well, <laughs> right. but the, um, I would say b briefly that the, the role of randomness and uncertainty in biological evolution and in the cosmos um, is so great that I don't think it can be reconciled with determinism, unless determinism is a way of planning for randomness and uncertainty, which doesn't seem which it isn't. to make much ontological sense. So. My own casuistry on this point is to say, if asked if I have free will, is to say, of course I have, I have no choice. <laughs> Clever. And at least I know I'm being ironic, but the people who say, of course you have free will, the boss in heaven says you have to have it, are speaking nonsense on stilts. This gentleman right here, that gentleman at the Hello. corner, and then unfortunately Hello? I think we'll oh, have to wrap up. here I am. Hi. Um, <laughs> Please be brief. Question to Professor Haldane. Um, I never understood how divinely inspired morals are more convincing than, say, instinctively inspired morals. So, my question is, if for some reason the Holy Spirit would decide to have another encounter 2,010 years after the first one, and Jesus would then have a half-brother, and that half-brother would tell the church officials, for example, you know, that after all, the Lord made up his mind, we can now accept morally torture, rape, and mass murder, for example. Um, would you take his word again? Well, I thought I'd sort of addressed that point, not exactly in the colorful terms in which you present it now, but um, when I said that, uh, that I, and, and this in, in the way there is a kind of odd agreement between us, because I actually think there is a moral test on the adequacy of a proclaimed revelation. Right? That's to say, if somebody says, look, verily I say unto you, the Lord saith, go forth and torture the innocent, which of course uh, in certain aspects of Hebrew scripture some think he did say precisely that. I think that is, has to be subject to a test of ethical credibility. Now, so, and, and again just to repeat, I'm sorry to repeat the point but I'm going to have to do so, is my claim is that the role of a religious conception in this is not in giving the content of moral prescriptions or commands but setting the condition of the possibility of there being intrinsic moral values. That's really the point. And we, in a sense, we've returned to this again and again, because, I mean, a question was posed from over here, and another question I think was posed from over there. Christopher has been, on this occasion, on many occasions in the past, righteously indignant about certain matters. And in response, I think, to perhaps the opening question, which was, what do you say about the empirical evidence that, say, people brought up in religious environments are less liable to, say, addiction, whatever it might be. His response to that is to say, first of all, that may or may not be the case, but even if it were yeah. the case, that says nothing about 
the credibility or the reasonableness of those religious beliefs. You have to look at those in their own. I agree with that. That is to say, I think we have to bring in a certain kind of critical evaluation. But my claim is that what that moral critical evaluation reveals is a dimension of reflexive moral consciousness that is not itself accounted for within the, within the naturalistic worldview, that we find ourselves charged, as it were, with a moral sensitivity and an aspiration towards the good, but also with an element of conflictedness. And the question is, how is that possible? I have an answer to that, as a religious answer, if you like. Christopher wants to say, I don't know what the answer to that is. Perhaps evolution is a part of the explanation, but we don't need an answer to it. I think if you say we don't need an answer to it, then you collapse back into a kind of acceptance that we may be blown wherever the wind carries us. Whereas I want to try and find a foundation that will make us secure against those winds of fashion, tide and time. Got it. Um, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, we, know from, we know from the Bible that uh, the Virgin Mary did have quite a lot of other children. But you, uh, excuse me? Uh, we know from the study of the New Testament that the Virgin Mary did have quite a number of other children. You can duke it out at the reception. You didn't, what? I was just telling them they could duke it out with you at the reception. Um, yeah. This is a topic. I wasn't sure if they were saying, are, well, are they complaining that they can here or that they can't? Make up your mind. Um, we know from the New Testament that the They're Virgin Mary did have a number of... Jesus. You didn't Probably have to invent Jesus. such an extreme contingency um, for your question, mm. because one of the things that makes theology, I think, incoherent and absurd is that not content with creating a supreme being full of love and care, there's another supreme being has to be created who was once himself an angel in heaven, who is the source of all woe and evil and temptation. And the God can't seem to defeat him uh, nor can he seem to save his creatures from having created the Manichaean uh, opposite. So don't worry, your question was anticipated. Um, oh yes, uh, the, the, the one who mandates torture and, and slavery and wickedness is already amongst us by divine mandate. How do you like that? What could possibly be more ridiculous? Last question. Hello. Um, I, so, I suppose I have a rather redundant question to ask actually. Um, and that's on the actual possibility. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not getting this. Can, we, can others just be quiet so we can hear what you're saying? I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I suppose I have a rather redundant question to ask as to... Please bear with me. Get I'll on, translate. Get we, we, we'll be the it. judges of that. Yeah, come on, let's hear the question. Uh, as to the actual possibility of a dialogue between an atheist and someone who is a believer, the uh, 20th century intellectual Arthur Kessler once called communism psychology and Catholicism closed systems. Now obviously that was a very catchy catchphrase and uh, Catholicism, the way he was using the term, could be expanded. But it does raise the question of a closed system. If we take a closed system to refer to something as very logical, uh, very coherent, working together, and rationality is that looking outwards to some objective fact as you were both arguing about, it would seem to me that say Catholicism doesn't really allow an opening for a sincere dialogue of sorts. And in this case, uh, I suppose one example, you might look to say nat uh, natural law in the US, where just about every noted uh, scholar of it happens to be Catholic. Now, not that that necessarily proves one thing or another, but I think it's rather curious. And I would just ask, uh, believing you do have a rational or a logical system, with a reference in rationality, how does that allow you to talk with somebody um, who just frankly doesn't agree on the facts? Well, I, I think we have been talking, haven't we? But look, uh, it, one of the issues that divides uh, the larger Christian community, um, and I fall on one side of that divide, and many here who are Christians fall on the other side of it, is the notion of the development of doctrine. Uh, one of the things that people who would describe themselves as biblical Christians hold fiercely against Roman Catholicism and its shadow variants, perhaps Anglicanism in some modes, uh, is the presumption, as they would see it, to um, supplement uh, biblical revelation with a whole set of doctrines, dogmas, and claims, and so on. Now, I don't want to go into the particularities, and there isn't the time to do so, but what I would say is that it's part of the tradition to which I belong 
which would, would be true also of the Orthodox and of others, and including some within the Reformed tradition, at any rate, some Lutherans and others, that actually it's part of this creation of which we are beneficiaries uh, that we have the means to interpret something like a revelation. Uh, and interpreting it here can in part be a matter of elaborating, explicating, work out what's implied and so on, but it's also a process of selection. And within the tradition to which I belong, one thing that's emphasized is that it isn't the case that the church is a product of the Bible. It's the case that the Bible is a product of the church, that it was a process of selection begun in the apostolic period and continued until the period of canonization of the Bible in the fourth century. It's a process of intellectual filtering, judgment, putting into interplay uh, various kinds of considerations and so on. And many of those considerations and many of those modes of interplay were drawn from the Hellenic world and indeed from uh, Roman jurisprudential theory and so on. So I think there's no tradition in engaging in that broader intellectual dialogue. It seems to be something that at any rate my tradition has been doing for at least 1700 years. Right, on that note, silence. <laughs> we'll, let's just get a one minute summary from each, and we don't have to time it, just be quick, of uh, any final thoughts that you have, and if you have none in particular, then focus them on what it was that either brought you to the view that you hold or kind of helped clinch it for you, just to end on a personal note. Uh, I think I just want to say that um, those who have uh, some impression of uh, an outer figure, a creator, a supervisor, and so forth, may possibly be able to get as far as a deist position and to say, well, given how little we know and how much we know we don't know, we can't absolutely say there isn't a prime mover. We can say there's no evidence for it, but we can't say that there isn't one. The evidence might be undiscovered. I'm willing to debate that and have often done so. But the argument for theism, that there, not only can we establish this prime mover's existence, but we can show by some form of induction that he intervenes in wars, that he answers prayers, that he cares who we sleep with and in what position, uh, that uh, what food we eat and on what days, is a ridiculous proposition. It's a claim to a truth that no primate can claim to make Primates who claim to know it should be distrusted. Great damage has been done and continues to be done by such people and by, and by such ideas. You're better off thinking for yourself and taking all the risks and, I might add, all the pleasures that will come from that. The most overrated of the virtues is faith. The metaphysical claims of religion are untrue. Thank you. Your turn. Thank you. Well, let, let me just begin briefly with a supplement to the previous answer I gave, because I suppose that one thing that some might feel is that there's a kind of, uh, a danger of a kind of arrogant intellectualism here in dealing with matters of religion uh, adopted by the tradition from out of which I'm speaking, one in which notions of natural law play an important part. And uh, one thing that uh, sometimes some Christians are neglectful of, which other Christians rightly remind us of, is the idea that uh, what we come to and what we're, is also a matter of what we're brought to. Um, that actually what I haven't mentioned so far is the role of grace. Um, grace not as something merited, but something is freely given. Um, and I think it is an ineliminable part of religious faith, faith understood as trust. Uh, that that be something that one receives rather than something that one earns or secures by, by, by one's own intellectual or other endeavors. So that's one thing. The second thing, however, is that really I just return to where I began, which is that we stand in need, and I would have thought this was ever more evident in the kind of widely degraded and conflicted uh, culture that we inhabit, we stand in need of a kind of ennobling conception of what it is to be a human being. And I don't think that that's what's at issue between us. The question is whether or not that conception be, can be given out of the resources of, say, something like enlightenment reason, or whether it's something that has to have a deeper foundation, if you like, an ontological foundation, a foundation in the kinds of beings that we are, not just the ways in which we choose to think of. 
I think it has to have that uh, ontological foundation, and I see no possibility of it having that foundation other than within the scheme of creation. So at the end of the day, it was a combination of some reason and perhaps some grace. Uh, those are the factors that are determined quite where the position that I occupy. But whether you share any part of that, that quest for a conception of the human that will serve to ground a kind of mutual respect uh, and a sense of human worth and so on is a search that goes on and I think to some extent is imperiled by aspects of the kind of degraded culture we inhabit. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, the, f the fun does not end here. It continues across the street at Blackwell's with a book signing and some wine. So join me once more in thanking our speakers and then head over there. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.